Hello, A&P students. This is Mr. Becker here to discuss the second histology lab, integument, bone, and spinal cord. Last lab, we examined all of the major types of tissue found in the human body. This lab, we will assemble those tissues into organs. An organ is defined as two or more tissues acting together to perform a function or functions that neither tissue can accomplish on their own. The first organ we will look at is the integument, or skin. The integument is a good organ to start with because it contains all four tissue types in it. Integument can be broken down into two major classes, thick skin and thin skin. We will use thick skin to show the general characteristics of integument and then discuss the specific structures and tissues we can find in each class. Integument is composed of two primary layers. The outer layer is composed of a keratinizing stratified squamous epithelium and is called the epidermis. The inner layer is composed primarily of dense irregular connective tissue and is called the dermis. The dermis also contains islands of adipose tissue, blood vessels, nerves, small muscles like the erector pili muscles, various glands, and hair. Underlying the dermis is the subcutaneous tissue layer or the hypodermis layer. The hypodermis contains tissues that will connect the integument to the underlying muscles and bones. Large regions of adipose tissue can also be found here as well. Here is a high magnification image of epidermis. The dermis is composed of dense irregular connective tissue. Projecting outward from the dermis are dermal papillae. Dermal papillae are dome-shaped projections that will increase contact between the dermis and the epidermis. Following the contours of the dermal papillae is the deepest layer of the epidermis, the stratum basale. The stratum basale contains a single layer of cuboidal to low columnar shaped cells. Stem cells that produce all of the cells in the layers above are found in the stratum basale. The layer above the stratum basale is the stratum spinosum. The stratum spinosum contains live cells and is, a, and is a variable number of cell layers thick. The cells are described as spiny as they take on unusual shapes to help fill in the space between the stratum basale and the stratum granulosum. The stratum granulosum is the next most outward layer. It is composed of three to five cell layers that begin the process of keratinization in earnest. The lowest layer may have visible nuclei but the upper layers have usually lost their nuclei. The production of keratin produces a darkly staining layer. In thick skin, the fourth layer moving outward is the stratum lucidum. This layer is not found in thin skin. The stratum lucidum features a lightly staining layer of two to three cells. The stratum lucidum is undergoing an intermediate step in the process of keratinization producing a protein intermediate called eleidin. Eleidin does not absorb most stains and appears lighter than the other layers. The outermost layer of the integument is the stratum corneum. In thick skin, the stratum corneum will be approximately 50 cell layers thick, while in thin skin, it's only 20 cell layers thick. We see the same basic organization in thin skin as we do in thick skin. The primary difference is the lack of a stratum lucidum in thin skin. Dermal papillae form an irregular up and down surface to which the stratum basale is attached. The stratum spinosum fills in the space between the stratum basale and the stratum granulosum. The stratum granulosum seems to form the outermost contiguous layer in most thin skin sections. Note the lack of an easy to see stratum lucidum. Finally, the much thinner layer of the stratum corneum is only composed of an average of around 20 layers. Without the intermediate step of eleidin formation, the layers of cells in stratum corneum are not held together very well, and they form something that looks like scales or piles of hair sitting on the stratum granulosum. Thin skin stratum corneum does appear very different than thick skin stratum corneum, but they are actually the same layer. The dermis is a much thicker layer located under the epidermis. This line is the stratum basale of the epidermis. The dermis is composed of two layers. 
the papillary layer, and the reticular layer. The papillary layer is composed primarily of areolar connective tissue, while the reticular layer is composed primarily of dense irregular connective tissue. The name is a bit misleading in that it is not composed of reticular connective tissue. The reticular layer is where we find most of the structures of the dermis, like blood vessels, glands, nerves, and islands of adipose tissue. Let's examine several nervous structures found in the integument. The first of these is the tactile or Meissner's corpuscle. Here we can see the dermis to the right and the stratum basale, stratum spinosum, and stratum granulosum to the left. Located in the dermal papillae throughout the body are tactile corpuscles. Tactile corpuscles have a twisted cone-like shape to their organization. They are used for light touch. Lamellar or proscenium corpuscles are located much deeper in the dermis. Generally, they are found in the reticular layer of the dermis surrounded by dense irregular connective tissue. They have a look similar to that of a cut onion. You can see the layers or lamellae that surround the central stalk, which is the nerve ending. Lamellar corpuscles are used in sensing deep pressure, such as when someone pokes you. Human hairs extend from deep inside the reticular layer of the dermis to outside the integument. This image focuses on one hair follicle, the deepest portion of the hair. The root of the hair originates in the hair follicle. The end of the hair forms a widened bulb that contains a hair papilla. The papilla contains stem cells and a capillary network to deliver nutrients. As hair cells grow out of the bulb, they form layers. The cell nuclei are the hair's cortex. Surrounding the cortex is the hair's cuticle. The hair is in a shaft that is composed of a root sheath composed of two layers. The epithelial root sheath is a non-keratinized stratified squamous epithelium. The connective tissue root sheath is composed of dense irregular connective tissue to hold everything together. Also found in the dermis are accessory structures like glands and erector pili muscles. Erector pili muscles are smooth muscle attached to the roots of hair follicles and to the dermal papillae. When they contract, they pull the hair upright, giving us goosebumps. Associated with hair follicles are sebaceous glands. Sebaceous glands take on a shape that varies from a near spherical to kidney bean shape. The cells are large with a centrally positioned nucleus in a very light staining cytoplasm. Miracrine glands are one of two sweat glands. They are formed from stratified cuboidal epithelium, which isn't always clear. They form a coiled tube structure that have the tubes in close association. Apocrine sweat glands are much larger in diameter with large lumens and thicker stratified cuboidal epithelium. These are found in the greatest quantity in tissues from the armpit, so you may not find many of them in our scalp slides. Our next tissue is spongy or cancellous bone, which is developed from primary bone. There are long, thin rods of bone called trabeculae that attach to each other to form an irregular network of bone. The space between trabeculae are filled with bone marrow, which will form blood cells. You can also see several blood vessels running through the bone marrow. The trabeculae are formed from osteons. However, they have not reached the complexity of a herversion system. You can see the osteocytes occupying lacunae in a few distinct layers inside each trabecula. On one outer margin, you can see a highlighted osteoblast, the bone cells that help to build bone. Osteoblasts form a group of cells to build bone and therefore look multinucleate. This is a slide of endochondral bone growth, showing the five zones found in an epiphyseal plate. On one end, we have the zone of resting or reserve cartilage. This looks like normal hyaline cartilage and grows through the normal growth mechanisms for hyaline cartilage. When a chondrocyte in a lacuna enters the zone of proliferating cartilage, the chondrocytes begin rapidly dividing and eating through the surrounding matrix. Because the divisions are much faster than the matrix's destruction, the zone takes on a stacked coin look inside of the clear lacunae. When the elongated lacunae leave the zone of proliferating cartilage, they enter the zone of hypertrophic cartilage. 
there, the chondrocytes begin to hypertrophy, no longer dividing. Instead, they grow in size. The chondrocytes digest the surrounding cartilage, opening up the tissue, so there is significantly less matrix. Then we enter the zone of calcified cartilage. The opening of the lacunae allows osteocytes to enter and begin depositing calcium onto the remaining matrix. This starves the chondrocytes, killing them, and osteocytes can replace them. Instead of a pink lucent color stain like cartilage, the edges become more darkly stained as bone is actively laid down. The final zone is the zone of, zo of ossification. In the zone of ossification, the osteocytes and bone marrow infiltrate the area and begin building true bone. You can find osteocytes in lacunae surrounded by bone tissue instead of cartilage. Isolated central islands of cartilage are left in only a few areas as the osteocytes work to convert everything into spongy bone. The final slide we will look at is a histological cross-section of spinal cord. The spinal cord is composed of two things, an inner layer of gray matter and an outer layer of white matter. Gray matter is composed of the cell bodies of neurons and unmyelinated axons. White matter is composed of myelinated axons. Running through the center of the spinal cord is the central canal, which brings cerebrospinal fluid, or CSF, down from the brain. Dividing the spinal cord into left and right halves are the ventral median fissure and the dorsal median sulcus. Note that a fissure is much wider and deeper than a sulcus. Bridging between the left and right halves is a gray commissure ca carrying unmyelinated axons and a white commissure carrying myelinated axons. The gray matter is organized into a butterfly shape in cross section with three horns. The dorsal horn contains cell bodies for interneurons that will synapse with incoming sensory neurons axons. The lateral horn contains cell bodies for autonomic motor neurons that will synapse with axons from incoming sensory or incoming interneurons. The ventral horn contains somatic motor cells, cell bodies that will synapse with axons of incoming sensory or interneurons. Similar to the organization of the gray matter horns, the white matter is split into three regions called funiculi. Each funiculus has axons carrying specific information. The dorsal funiculus contains only axons that are carrying sensory information up the spinal cord toward the brain. The ventral funiculus contains only axons carrying motor information down the spinal cord. The lateral funiculus contains both sensory and motor pathways, but the sensory pathways are mostly dorsal and the motor pathways are mostly ventral. So the pathways for information movement in the spinal cord are very strict.